Hello, this is Leon Finney, your host of Intersections, where faith, business, and politics meet. This week, we have with us Miss Alita Clark, a young woman of 26 years old that, in reaction to the murder of Tyshawn Lee, decided to organize Hugs No Slugs. She has been actively involved in various crime prevention efforts to stop the shootings in Englewood. Recently, Jesse White, the Secretary of the State of Illinois, gave her the Humanitarian A Year Award. Wow, with all of that, who are you? And where did you come from that you would accomplish all these things just at 26 years old? What inspired you to get involved? And where do you come from? Well, I'm just a regular girl from Inglewood. Um, my neighborhood inspired me. I live in Inglewood, and to see firsthand things that go on, like to hear the gunshots outside my house, not just in my neighborhood, right outside my house, to hear that and to not be able to do anything about the person that's shooting, it's like, well, what could you do? So I decided to start an organization that puts me in position to try to prevent gun violence of any sort and um, to try to better my community and make it a safer place. So you have two children. I do. So what about them? Well, everything I do is for them. I feel like if I create a safe path for myself, then I'm creating a safe path. And you have a son too, right? Yes, I have a six-year-old son. Mm -hmm. So how does he feel about what you're doing? And well, he's scared, naturally. Um, when uh, Tyshawn Lee got killed, the nine-year-old boy, I explained it to him, and it scared him, and he didn't want to go to the park. And that really upset me that my son doesn't want to go to the park. And this is a public park? Yeah, the public park in our neighborhood. He doesn't even want to go. And I asked him why, and he said, because I don't want to get shot. And how old is he? He's only six. And so he felt that this was just a little bit too violent for yeah. a six-year-old boy. So what did you do next? I started a movement. I, I, I birthed Hugs No Slugs. Hugs No Slugs, it means, you know, the love starts from home. You have to love your kids so they don't get out and get in the streets and start shooting people, which would, you know, talk about the slugs. And oh, that's what Hugs No Slugs mean. Yeah. Oh, love with a hug. Yeah, love with a hug so we don't have to get to the slugs. Right. And so you started that. When did you start the organization? The day after Tyshawn's funeral, uh, November 12th. Mm -hmm. And so how is that movement going now? Um, I would love to do more. I think that it's, it's doing pretty well. Um, I've gotten a lot of people involved. Um, creating awareness right now is something that I'm really focused on, but I've been able to do a lot of good things for the community, for my people, and um, I only want to do more. So, and it was that, out of that movement that you decided to take 16,000 bottles of water to Flint, Michigan. Why Flint, Michigan? Uh, what made you go to, all the way to Flint to help? Well, because I'm from Chicago, and I don't think that there's enough positive light shined on Chicago. I wanted my movement to be the light for Chicago. So, not only will I do stuff for my city, but if I can help and get other people from my city to help somebody else, then that's what we wanted to do, and that's what we did, and it only took a week. And so how did you get 16,000 bottles of water from Chicago all the way to Flint, Michigan, to help, I guess, in a crisis over water because water was contaminated there? Yeah, and we take water for granted here. We lead the water running. You know, we get water bottles, drink a little bit, throw the rest in the back seat. So what I did was I put it out on my social media. On your social media? My Facebook and my Instagram, and I let them know that Hugs No Slugs was doing a water drive for Flint, Michigan, and that um, you can drop off water at UBM, Urban Broadcast Media. I told them the location, and before you knew it, my friends were getting involved in doing the same thing also. So because of the supporters from Chicago, because of my Instagram, because of my, um, my Facebook, I was able to accumulate 16,746 bottles within oh, a week. I'm so sorry. I <laughs> cut you short by 700 bottles, right? <laughs> so uh, you took them there. Now, once you got the water to Flint, Michigan, then what did you do? Did you just sort of drop them off and somebody distribute, distribute them? What happened? Oh, no, no, no. We researched the projects of Flint, which is on Carpenter Street, 
and we worked the entire projects, taking water door projects to Projects meaning public housing? Yeah, like the um, poverty-stricken area, mm -hmm. um, lower income housing, stuff of that nature. And we went door to door dropping off cases of water to the families. And they was just, the look on their face, like uh, how we, like, would be if somebody gave us a check. Mm -hmm. This is a check for $1,000. Oh my God, thank you so much. That's how they was to get a case of water. Stuff that we take for granted here in Chicago. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like, I was glad that we was able to make a difference as a unit, as a city, and as an organization. Mm -hmm. And so, door-to-door uh, -door in yeah. the public housing projects, yes. you took water. Yes, yeah. and we also went to a youth center and dropped off water, and we went to a, um, a disabled um, transitional living house. And so, how did you feel about that? I was just, I was just, I don't know, it was overwhelming. It was an overwhelming and emotional experience because we always talk about how hard we got it until you actually be faced with somebody who live in, in the worst condition than you are. So it was a real humbling experience. And by me getting so many people involved and letting them actually see what happened over there because I was using my phone to take, get as much coverage as possible, you know, it was, it was, it was incredible. It was incredible. It made, it made you feel that you were worthwhile, right? You know what? I won't, I, won't, I won't say that it made me feel that I was worthwhile. It made me feel that my life mattered, so I made somebody else's situation better. Wow. Well, that's deep for a 26-year-old. We're going to have to take a short break, and when we come back, we will resume our conversation. During Black History Month, mm -hmm. the Secretary of the State of Illinois chose to give you an award, the Humanitarian of the Year Award. How did that make you feel then? What do you think made you deserving of that award? Well, honestly, I didn't feel like I deserved it. It was so... The year just started, and I know I've done so much for my people, for my community, but I just, to receive a award so big from the Secretary of State, it was a big deal for me. It was, it was definitely it was something. It was a big that, deal. Your, your, your son was there too, right? Yeah, it was, it, was a big, it was a big deal for me. It was, it was, I wasn't prepared for it, but I was really honored. It was a great experience. So tell me some of the things that you think led up to that award outside of the question of the Flint, Michigan water. What else have you done in your brief 26 years? Um, well, I've taken it upon myself and gotten a couple friends involved last week, mm -hmm. and we fed 300 homeless people mm -hmm. where we actually went out and bought fed the food. Fed how many? 300. Homeless people? Yes. What did you feed them? Chicago. We fed them baked chicken, macaroni and cheese, yams, and um, greens, greens, yams, baked macaroni and cheese, and chicken. All right. But where would you, did you go to a union hall or a church? Or? Oh, no. We just drove around Chicago. Like, wherever we seen a homeless person. You spread them in the streets? Yeah. yeah. For real? Yeah. What made you do that? Well, because I feel like I didn't, people were telling me, like, you should go to the shelters. Well, they're already in the shelter. I'm pretty sure they probably ate for the day. I want to touch the people that sleep on the sidewalk. They probably ain't ate at all. Those are the people I want to bless, you know, mm -hmm. if, as long as they take it. Because I did have a few that was like, I don't want this, I want some money. Mm -hmm. so. so what in your background now? So you wanted to touch those who are the least of God's children. So what was in your background that makes you want to 
reach out to people who are in distress? Did you have a, uh, were you born with a silver spoon in your mouth? What in your background makes you have the kind of feelings that you have well, for those who are on the least? Well, I felt just like them. Um, no, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, and I was not necessarily dealt the best hand um, coming up. I was without a lot. And just recently, uh, three years ago, I was homeless myself. And you were homeless yourself? I was homeless myself. And um, I actually had lost my children because I was homeless at the time. And it, I went through so much being there, but I, I didn't give up. You know, I didn't have a place to live, but I was still able to work. I used to walk every day from 66th and Justine to 115th and Marshfield just to keep my job. And I had holes in my shoes when I made manager. And they didn't know that I was living in the crack house at my mom's house or living in the trap house on the block or trying to figure out if I could stay, you know, spend the night on my auntie's floor. When all of that failed, I started living in the motel, walking from the motel to my job. I went on my lunch break and I got me an apartment. And I have that apartment to this day. I went back to court and I fought for my children, and I have my children to this day. So I don't know if they have the hope that I have and or the motivation and the drive that I had when I was out there, when I didn't have anything or anybody and wasn't nobody willing to feed me. So I just wanted to be the person that is willing to feed them. So you had to, at a point in your life, had to live in a crack house? Mm -hmm. And dope house, so how did, how did you manage to escape becoming addicted yourself? Well, drugs ain't for everybody. Um, <clears throat> I've tried to smoke weed when I was younger. It just wasn't for me. So given the fact that my mother was a heroin user all of my life until she died in October of last year. <clears throat> Take your time. Until she died um, in October of last year from a heroin overdose, I just, it was just something that I've always told myself, like, I would never get into that lifestyle because it took me away from her. It took all of her kids away from her. It took her life away from her. So that would be nothing that interests me. And I, I just never got into it. Mm -hmm. And so your mom passed from a drug overdose mm -hmm. last year. Yeah. Well, certainly. Our condolences are with you. I know that you're still troubled and in deep pain. So how did you end up, uh, so you ended up homeless and without children. And so what, what was that about? Well, um, I was in a domestic, uh, domestic relationship with my children's father, and I, had, I was tired. And I just decided enough was enough, mm -hmm. and I left. I didn't have a you know, a good relationship with family members. They didn't know what was going on. So when I left, here I am. I've been boxed in the house for so long where well, everything that I'm used to is at that house. Now I'm out here by myself. I don't know how to call somebody and be like, hey, I'm homeless. Can I come over there? Or would they even receive me because I haven't talked to them in years because I wasn't allowed to. They don't have to understand You say that. you weren't allowed to. You mean the relationship you were in? Right. My kid's father was, like, extremely insecure that when people call my phone, he would think that it was somebody I was trying to talk to or somebody I was trying to be with versus him. So nobody really called me. If it wasn't him or my dad or my brothers, I didn't have friends that I went and hung out with outside of the family. And that's all I did. I went to college and I came home and I was just home all the time, never went out or anything. So it was like when I left him, I didn't really have anywhere to go. So I reached out to my mother who I knew she was on drugs and had been on drugs my whole life and I've never lived with her in my life. And I asked her, you know, if I could stay with her and she said, yeah, I lived with her and in and out all night long, people was coming in and out, you know, no. drug users. And I, I just couldn't live that lifestyle because it was, it was tearing my spirit down to know that I, I don't have anywhere else to go, but I have to live here and watch my mom do the things that she do that took her away from me. Mm -hmm. And so I just couldn't deal with it anymore and I left. Hold on, Anita. this is a powerful moment. We're gonna have to take a short break and when we come back, we'll resume this very, very important time. Okay. Bronzeville Jerk Shack, Chicago's answer to the classic flavors and feel of roadside Jamaican cuisine. We are open every day, 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. at 5055 South Prairie Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, 60615. Also, the Jerk Shack caters. Call 773-548-JERK. That's 773-548-5375 
for more information. So we want to pick up right where we left off a little bit. So you called your mother, uh, who was a drug addict herself, mm -hmm. that later would pass away from a drug overdose. And she said, when you were running away from your, your, the home that you had built with the father of your children, I gather you were imprisoned almost uh, from what you said uh, in that relationship. Mm -hmm. You couldn't be your own person. So now you decide to run away, leaving your, uh, the father of your children and your children. No, so, no, no, no. I took my children with me. Okay. I just couldn't accept the fact that he lived in the house and I was living in my car at the time and in my mom's house. And I felt like I didn't want to keep exposing my kids to that because that was never something that they was used to. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to have to explain to them what was going on. Mm -hmm. So now, <laughs> when you say, what was going on then? The not being stable. Mm -hmm. The living in the crack house. Well, before we was even living in my mom's house, we was just living in my car and showering at her house. Oh, I'm sorry. So I get it right. You, you ran, you left your, the, the father of your children's home of the home that you, the two of you shared. Mm -hmm. Why did you leave that? Because he was abusive. Oh, he was abusive. It was a, an abusive. It was not only a controlling relationship, mm -hmm. but it was also an abusive physically. relationship. Mm -hmm. oh, physically abusive. Mm -hmm. Oh, I get it. So you're leaving a physically abusive relationship with the father of your children and then running or going to your mother's house and what you find in your mother's house is her addiction. Mm -hmm. And so how long were you there with her? Um, not that long, probably a little bit under a month. Um, I was just being exposed to too much that I wasn't comfortable with. And I knew that and I- that was the coming and going of the- The coming and going of, of the, the drug the, users. The, the and drug I'm user. there with my kids and Lord forbid anything was to happen. You know, I would not be able to forgive myself or be able to explain it. So I just had to get out of it. Mm -hmm. um, at that time I had you know, reached out to my kid's father and asked him, you know, could you just take the kids for a month until I get my taxes so I can get my own apartment? And he said, yeah, you know, take them to my mom's house. And I was like, okay, cool. I talked him to his mom's house. Like two weeks later, DCFS was at my job. They was trying to pick me up for abandonment and neglect. So my life just went for a 360 turn. Here's my kid's father. And I had to go to therapy to actually understand what was going on. And the therapist told me that it was the domestic cycle. He was no longer to control you physically or, you know, um, mentally. So he used the kids to control you. And it made sense. And even though that the judge, they never found it, anything that he stated, it was just the fact that he went that far to spite me to take my kids. And, like, I couldn't prove that I was stable because I was homeless. So the judge had granted the father... <clears throat> temporary placement and I just you know I was hopeless and I just kept feeling like I was losing I'm homeless I don't now the only thing I did have was my kids I shouldn't have never even called on him for help because now he just turned on me because I left him he turned on me and just took my kids from me so I went with like a whole year without being able to see my kids fighting going to court until it was all over when I got me in the apartment and I proved to the judge that I was a fit mom that the things that he stated they they aren't true he can't prove them and I want my children, and now my children are in my life. And so at this moment, you have your children back, mm -hmm. and you have your life back. I do. All right. So um, tell me, how do you have a sense that by taking the steps that you have taken regarding your children now, that your children are better off now than they were before in this abusive relationship? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that... Um, I mean, we can figure it out that they're better than being uh, in a home with, uh, with a crack uh, uh, grandparent. So, but now the question is, uh, what's the sense of whether or not your children are much better off now? Well, now we do joint custody, which means that we split everything up evenly, two weeks on, two weeks off. So it gives the kids an even balance because they're not just with him anymore. They're with both of us, and we're not together. Mm -hmm. So we make it work as parents. Um, of course, there's still some bumps in the road, like emotionally, the kids have some emotional issues that I'm trying to repair myself with just um, paying attention to them. And, you but know, DCF, uh, DCFS is out of your Oh, absolutely. Too. They've been out of it for a long time. So, um, yeah, none of the things that they found that were alleged were founded. So they was just like, 
this does not seem like a case for us. It sounds like y'all need Judge Mathis and God. That's what the, uh, the caseworker said to me. Wait, say that again. The caseworker told me that this didn't seem like a case for DCFS, mm -hmm. that this was spite and that we needed God and Judge Mathis. <laughs> oh, you needed God and Judge Mathis. Yeah. Oh, okay. Not DCFS. So I noticed at the, at the award ceremony that your son was with you. Mm -hmm. How did he feel about it, seeing He's, his mom? Right. He was really proud. He was really proud. And he had questions that he asked, you know, like, Mom, what, what did they give you? And I explained it to him, and he just gave me a hug. He was really happy. So. Yeah. Well, I bet you he was very proud of his mom. Yeah. What does he call you? Mom. Ma. Mom. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We're going to have to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll pick up right where we left off. Okay. Stay with us. I'm Reverend Rick McCain, and I'm here with my covenant partner, my beautiful wife, Brenda, and we're the hosts of Let's Stay Together Talk. Where we help people to understand the covenant of marriage and their relationship. Mm. People are able to trust us because we keep it real. So join Let's Stay Together Talk Tuesdays from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. on urbanbroadcastmedia.com. Because to see God's glory, we have to do what, baby? Hey, we've got to share our backstory. Sarah Camille for Collection, clothes that satisfy a woman's need for comfort and style. The collection celebrates the diversity of the female silhouette in an original way for each individual client. Organic designs exquisitely made allows clients the means to build an elegant, sophisticated, yet functional and timeless wardrobe. Available online and in store at 1510 East 63rd Street in Chicago. So, shifting just for a moment, we're in our last segment. Uh, Alita, our streets continue to be violent. February so far has doubled or has been doubled in terms of the number of shootings and killings over last year. We're an epidemic of gun violence in our community or our communities, neighborhoods. What do you have to say about what you see at 26 years old, you haven't lived on the streets of the city of Chicago, been homeless, been poor, and been abused? From that point of view, what do you see is what ought to be done in order to prevent and or end the violence? Well, in cases like, you know, gun violence and, you know, all the things that go on in the neighborhoods like Inglewood and so forth. I always like to think about it like the bigger picture. When people stick up a, a convenience store, I'm pretty sure that before they stick it up, they weigh out the options. It's a chance I can get away with it. It's a chance I might not. But for whatever reason, they, they follow through with doing it is the sad part. Why is there not enough resources in poverty-stricken areas where kids can go who never finished school and get their GED so that they can get a job, so that they can have hope of feeding their families. You know what I'm saying? Why does it have to be the only way to feed my family is to break the law? You know, or when they get caught up in the life and the gangs and the I want respect, I want to feel important, why does it have to be that way? I feel like we have to show them a different way because I don't always feel like it's the life that they chose. It's the only life they know. So I want to be a part of changing that. I want to put resources in my community. 
You know, I want to find mentors for these young boys that's in the gangs. I can't go outside and, who got the gun? You got the gun? Don't kill nobody today, okay? It's kids out here. But what I can do is put so much activity positively in the community that they won't even have a chance to do it. If you see a block club party going on every other weekend, when are you going to have a chance to shoot somebody? Oh, you might shoot somebody across Ashland, so that means now we need to move across Ashland. We need to have more than one, more than one, we need to have more resources in the community for people to get jobs. You know, people need to, you know, trying to start figuring out how could you help versus hurt. Oh, that's a nice line, how to help versus hurt. And I don't think that hugs no slugs is going to cease all the gun violence, but I think we can minimize it. And that's what I want to work on. I want to start. It's a lot of people out here saying how bad everything is, but what is the solution? What are you doing to stop it? So what I'm doing is right now is raising awareness that you don't have to do this. You can do this. If you want to join a gang, join a positive one. Join Hugs No Slugs. Get involved with your community where you can get respect. You know what I'm saying? So that's where I want to start. So let me get it straight. You think that the problem or one of the problems is an absence of alternatives. Absolutely. For the kids and the young people in these neighborhoods. Yeah. An absence of alternatives from selling drugs to selling something else. Exactly. Or doing something else. An absence of the recreational facilities and things that would pull kids off of the streets. That's kind of what you're saying. To take the people in your neighborhood in a different direction. Yes. Right? So, how would you go about doing that? What are you now, what is your next program to get resources other than calling for them? What are you working on now? Well, right now I'm trying to establish something called Hugs No Slugs Team Talk. What that does is it's going to be a television show where I'm going to sit down and I'm going to talk to youth. And I'm going to get their voice and see what they're talking about and see how they feel about certain things and, and, and what what would they like to see happen? So here I am talking to a 16-year-old boy who I seen recently in the picture throwing up a gang sign. Now I get to hear what made him join the gang. Is, do he have any goals in life? Well, how can I help you? Is there anything I can do to help you achieve that? Are you comfortable living in your environment? And if not, why not? Is there anything I can do to make you comfortable? Is there anything can you, would you be willing to be a part of helping me help you? And the more I feel like I'm able to touch, because that's where it starts. It starts with the little kids at home who, were, who hugs no slugs is trying to protect. And then you got the teenagers who want to be so important, so bad that they're willing to do anything, you know, for a name and for respect. Well, if I can shift that want to be important so bad in a negative aspect into a positive light, I think that we might have something. Well, that's a deep agenda. And certainly one that I think that the city of Chicago and those of your neighborhood need to listen to. I'm impressed by your work. And I can say this, should you decide to have your own TV talk show, UBM is here at your service. Thank you. I want to thank you, Alita, for the time you spent with us. Thanks. And it's just great knowing you at 26 years old. Thank you. This is Alita Clark and this is Leon Finney. And we want to sign off on our program.